Uh, and just a brief introduction to uh, each of them. Dinesh Ramesh, uh, Dineshi Ramesh, excuse me, is the advisory partner at Board Intelligence. She's a thought leader in culture, risk, and conduct, and has uh, 20 years' experience uh, as a strategy. Uh, consultant, and that's her uh, there. Immediately next to me is uh, Mark Romano, who's Head of Cyber and Professional Indemnity at AIG, the insurer. He's a specialist in risk management. And uh, Steve Rumble, uh, over at the end there, is the Technology Risk Partner at BDO, and he has decades of experience in IT audit, da data analytics, and risk management. So we're going to talk about what a good cyber security culture looks like and what a bad cyber security culture uh, looks like. Steve, why don't you go first? Let's, let's have the positive first of all. What does a good uh, culture of cyber security look like? Um, well, in terms of uh, an organization, I think it has a number of uh, facets. So definitely the tone from the top, which we may want to come back to. So mm -hmm. getting that tone from the top is really, really important. Um, I've touched on in the workshops for those that have been there, the number one challenge I think organizations face actually is understanding their threats properly. And we had the session this morning, and I know that touched on it, um, but it's really understanding what that means in your business. And the more you spend time understanding that, the better placed you are then to come up with what your strategy is and everything else. And then the third piece is around the people agenda. I mean, it's been well talked about already, but if you don't get the people agenda right, um, the increase in risk to your business is greater because that's what they play on is people. Did actually flesh that point out a little bit for us, the importance of not just having the right people, but engaging them, motivating them, making them realize that there's a common purpose, it's their issue, their challenge, as much as anyone else's. Mm. Um, so one of the things that we notice is, um, and as with culture generally, corporate culture, is that it's no, no one individual's role or no one group of individuals' role. So culture, um, when it's talked about, as you mentioned, um, is very much meant to be driven by the top. But that's, that's kind of making culture to be something that is apart from the running of the business. And similarly, when it comes to cyber threat, it's you know, considered by some organisations something that is apart from the mainstream of the business. So it is the responsibility of the CIO or the CTO to uh, kind of prevail over the threats and develop um, strategies to prevent and um, kind of secure yourself um, against them, these kinds of threats. But um, I think that's kind of missing the point a little bit because one of the um, greatest things that we see, you know, some of the threats that have been talked about that prevail today originate with the people. And there are people um, that can be sometimes within your organization, not just as sort of external threats. So if you know, and if, if you ask me, you know, what does culture actually mean? Well, I think it boils down to the people in your organization and your supply chain and kind of third parties that you deal with, um, and their behavior. And their behavior, especially when they believe that they're not being watched. Um, and, and that's a very generic term, but what does that mean then in the world of kind of cyber security? Um, well, it means that everyone within a firm needs to understand not just the threat, but their role in defending kind of the information, information or whatever it happens to be within their organisation. So I take kind of the example... Um, you know, uh, kind of in, in our firm, we're a knowledge business, as many of your businesses must be as well, or service industries. And we, we hold a lot of very highly sensitive client information. It's not transactional data, it's corporate kind of data. And um, one of the kind of biggest threats is not, um, well, one of the biggest threats that we're dealing with right now is not so much where our data is held, so in, in a data center. It's not the sort of firewalls or security technology defenses, but it's the way our people behave. It's the way we look after our um, IT equipment when we are out of the office down the pub. It's the way we deal with visitors to our office. Um, and it's, you know, simple things like managing kind of password changes. So it's... Um, and, and what's you know what does a good information security culture look like? Well, it's one where there is awareness that extends beyond the IT department um, and is made the kind of business of everyone in the firm, and everybody knows how they need to act and behave um, to, to support the defences that an organisation will put in place. There is a difference between there is a difference between people knowing how they are supposed to act and behave 
and them actually doing it, in that it's very easy to come up with a policy yeah. on culture. Actually having an authentic culture is much more challenging. No, absolutely. And so what, what do you do in that scenario? Um, well, the hallmarks, I, th I think there are a couple of hallmarks of um, a kind of uh, good culture, I mean, if, you, if you can call it that. Um, one of those hallmarks is to make things easy for people to do the right thing as opposed to the wrong thing. Um, and by that I mean, um, so let's take an example of you know, changing your passwords. We are periodically asked to kind of change our passwords on our laptops, let's say. But that is one of tens of other passwords that we happen to hold in our heads. Um, and what people revert to is changing their password ever so slightly into something quite simple that they can remember, which is not terribly secure. Worst case scenario, writing their password on a post-it and slapping it on their laptop. You know, neither of which are, uh, are good. A much simpler thing to do might be to implement something like one password, where um, a, a, a highly encrypted password is actually generated by your computer. You can use it for work, but you can use it for a variety of other kind of purposes, your own personal purposes, e-commerce websites. But there, all of a sudden, you are making it so much easier for that individual to change and keep a you know, valid password in place. So it, it's kind of reducing the barrier to doing the right thing. So I think that's one hallmark. The second hallmark, I would say, is um, you, you touched on incentives a little. I feel quite strongly about incentives and how they um, influence culture in that all the evidence points to that incentives don't really drive cultural change. They don't really make it stick. Um, but one thing I do believe in is if you've got a policy, it has to have teeth. So um, if, if you set out a way of doing things, you need to enforce it, you need to police it. So, you know, the organisation, people need to feel that this is important. And um, if it's not supported, there are consequences. Thank you. Mark, what does uh, good cybersecurity culture look like to you? Well, AIG, yeah, we look at things a little bit differently because we're actually ensuring uh, networks and uh, the, the data privacy. And so, you know, if you ask any underwriter, they're going to tell you that the, well, the main influencer in terms of, you know, how much limit you'll be able to get from the insurance market, the retentions, your premiums are going to be set as whether or not you have a good uh, culture of information security. And obviously, that's a lot more difficult to, to measure than it, than it sounds. Uh, we do agree that it does start from the top down. So, you know, a lot of the, um, the surveys that we've done of the, of the FTSE companies, for example, you have, you know, uh, almost half that aren't discussing cybersecurity on a regular basis. Uh, you have over 50% that don't understand the legal implications if they were to have a, a, a cyber incident, uh, yet you have over three quarters that actually are, are confident their IT team can, can actually protect them. Um, so I think that uh, one of our main thrusts is to, is to start the education process to make sure that the boards, because not only from a cyber perspective, but we also write quite a bit of uh, director and officer insurance. And so, and we're seeing claims now where, um, you know, the directors and officers uh, allege that there's negligence, that the, the board should have known that they had these important information assets yet failed to have good uh, corporate governance. So we start asking as part of the whole DNO underwriting process, um, you know, what is your, uh, you know, strategy around you know, the corporate governance with respect um, to, to information security. And we can usually tell pretty quickly, and, and there's a combination of things that we use, uh, both external data, uh, doing, doing conversations uh, with the company, talking to the chief security officer uh, and the rest of the team. And from there, we can f pretty much gauge and, and, and understand where they sort of fit in relationship with their industry uh, and what we see from underwriting other, other types of risks. And from there, that will definitely influence um, you know, how much capacity we're, we're willing to put up and, and uh, the deductible that you would have on, on one of those policies as well as the, the premium. Is there, a, is there a ubiquitous checklist? Is there a one-size-fits-all list of actions and priorities that apply to every company? Or is a cybersecurity policy something that needs to be tailored to the specific attributes of that specific business? I think it does vary, vary by business. And I think when you look at the underwriting process that we use, um, we start out with a standard sort of proposal application that, that somebody would complete. And from there, we try to make sure that they have the basic uh, cyber hygiene in, in place. And it sort of tracks to what you'd find in, you know, sort of a, 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 an ISO survey or a, um, uh, you know, like the cyber essentials, looking at some of the, the, the critical 
things that you, you, you have to be doing, right? Making sure you're patching and encryption. Um, and then from there, it's really dependent upon the industry. And so, for example, if, you're, if, you're, if we're working on a retailer, uh, we're going to take a close look uh, and focus a lot of the questioning around um, you know, the actual point of sale terminals and, and, and the training that you give around employees uh, and, how those, and how those terminals are serviced versus if you're talking to a manufacturer, it's going to be much different in just understanding um, you know, how uh, you know, they're not going to have a lot of personal information, but the, the, the key risk for us is there's some sort of incident that actually brings down the manufacturing capability and they're suffering uh, income loss and uh, a lot of extra expenses. So it does, I think it does vary uh, depending upon industry, but it does start at the top. I think no matter, regardless of the, the organization, if they don't believe that it's, it's serious, they don't take cybersecurity uh, seriously, you're, you're not going to see that trickle down to the individual employees. Steve, there must be common themes, common approaches that are useful. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give you a kind of context around this in terms of we go into organizations that are um, in crisis, so they've had a breach. And um, you kind of end up having the conversations with you know, board IT departments. And they'll be at different spectrums of the maturity. So if you're at um, the wrong end, actually, it was already always going to come your way. So you need to just rework every component part of your culture processes. Where it gets quite interesting is those that have really tried. So they've really tried to get it right, but they've still been breached. So they've had a you know, data theft is a really good example. And what that comes down to, the common things that are going wrong, one is, and I talked to a little bit of this at the workshop, is um, they may know what their crown jewel is, which I know we discussed this morning, but what they haven't been able to do properly is understand how many versions of it they had. So they said, right, it's customer data. We've lost our customer data, but we lost it from this data set over here. And we were protecting our crown jewel over here. So they haven't really got a proper understanding of their data landscape. So they've created their vulnerability. So that, and the board didn't know that. So the board, it's a big surprise because they'd be getting lots of positive assurance. And then the other end of the spectrum is they've been educating their people, but when you unpick it, they've run training of courses, but what they haven't done is tailored it to their business. And therefore, the, the, the end users don't fully understand when they're operating against the policies, what it is they're doing. So to bring it, bring it to life, if they knew they had 10 data sets, or one, sorry, one critical data set in 10 places, and the protection around it was X, Y, and Z, you can then look at your employee base to say, actually, for half of these data sets, these are privileged users only access to them, we'll t train those differently. And as a result, they'll understand that when they're accessing it, they have to have all the right protocols around you know, the policies and procedures. For other normal users, it's a more of a hygiene thing. And then you're into, right, how do we assure against this? And we talk, I know it came up earlier, but the whole testing, social engineering testing, is becoming the number one way of actually getting assurance over your people agenda in terms of culture. And, and you mentioned it earlier. In fact, all three of you have mentioned it. This is a, an issue for the board. The board cannot shovel off its responsibilities to the IT department or uh, to the uh, executive branch this is something the board directors need to be concerned with. Absolutely. And in terms of governance, um, you see different models. So you know, some, it's hard because you know, you've got to think about the, the skills that are required at a board level to really understand this agenda. So you sometimes do have that on the board, but invariably what tends to happen is there's a, a you know, good practice it would be a security committee or a security, a security group. And if they haven't got the skills in the business, they'll bring that person in at the points that are required and bring the other stakeholders into that, so business, technology, and then shape it so the board fully understands what a threat landscape is. And the, Absolutely the companies that you deal with, do they understand this? It, it, well, that's a great question. Um, the way I describe it is um, that the more mature the organization is and the more they've had this problem in the past, definitely, absolutely for sure, there's a, a large group where the education at board level is changing. They realize they're starting to invest. You know, we, you know, we ran a workshop for half a day and absolutely changed the mindsets of people. It's that sort of investment starting to happen. Um, but it takes time. It does take time. And there's an investment decision around this. And there's a lot of, I mean, I, the, the, the mindsets have changed, but will it happen to us? What's the reality? And until you've understood your threats, you know, data loss, sabotage, on your business, you may turn around and say, Actually, the chances are quite slim here that we're going to have a doomsday scenario. Otherwise, actually, we've got a lot to worry about. So now we, we're better educated. We can, that's the starting point. Uh, and, and Dinesh, it's not just a case that uh, the responsibility now lies at the very top of the organisation, but also that is where the culture of the organisation 
flows from. They give the direction. Absolutely. And I, I think it raises a kind of good question. Uh, some of the research, we, we work a lot um, here at Board Intel, sorry, my company, Board Intelligence, with boards um, from all sorts of organisations, the public sector, all the way through to FTSE 100. And one of the areas that commonly come up as an area of sort of weakness within the board, and just in terms of understanding, is the threat of cyber kind of security. Um, and uh, kind of, you know, how are they responding to that? Um, and and one, of, one of the solutions is to actually invite that capability onto the board as a permanent member of your board. Um, and then secondly, to educate that, um, a group, your, your board, on some of the threats and issues and challenges. Um, what we are, the way we approach it is pretty much the same as any subject that a board um, member will need to kind of know about, and that is to ask the right questions. Um, and to do that, you need a, a kind of base level of understanding of what the issues are. And so we, we observe um, kind of a lot of our boards who, who don't actually have, who aren't perhaps technology firms, and it's not the core part of their business, they will invite that sort of third party input to come and present to their board, run workshops, etc., and improve upskill, if you like, um, the board on that. But then the next set of questions are all about, well, how do you ensure, um, how do you ask the right questions of your management team? And how do you make sure that you're getting the assurance that you need from the business to, to gain some degree of comfort to the degree that you can, that things are the best they can be, or, um, you know, that, that there is continuous um, kind of testing, be it penetration testing, etc., on the vulnerable areas um, of your approach. So we think it's absolutely a, a sort of um, board level, top level kind of concern. And the response to it has, um, I'd, I'd say it's not entirely mature, and I don't know whether you would agree, um, but it's certainly up there as, as the t one of the top three issues. Mm. That are, are, some, are some boards resistant to this? Um, I don't think they're resistant. I think they're, they're concerned at how they can grasp the reality of it when they've got so many other competing demands on their time. I think that's the, that's the challenge. Um, and having the right insight within the organisation is really important. Yeah, I'll give you a good example where you get false assurance, actually, is you, know, you kind of get an, um, an, IT, an IT department that you know, run pen, penetration testing. Great. It's absolutely great. But what's the scope of that? What was the quality of it? And the board will sit there and go, that's great, we're doing penetration testing, we're okay. But it's not, you're not intelligent enough to ask mm. enough about what the, what the scope of it so was. It comes back to this point that they don't know what no, questions to ask the, to get the, the right answers. Uh, it helps, I imagine, if they have their insurance company whacking them about the head, uh, telling them this is important. Well, I mean, it's an area that we, tr we try to also provide a lot of educational materials to try and, and recognize it was difficult a couple of years ago. Uh, we actually worked with the National Association of Corporate Directors and the Internet Security Alliance to actually introduce a handbook that was rolled out first in the U.S. that was subsequently endorsed by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security as a workbook that, that uh, the company, any company could use uh, to get a kind of a starting point as to what, how they should, the types of questions they should ask and how they should sort of organize themselves and sort of dealing, dealing with this issue and subsequently have, have modified that and, and, and pushed it out here. But you're right, as part of the, uh, uh, you know, looking ahead, I think more and more companies will be contractually required to have some level of cyber insurance. Everything becomes so interconnected and, and as information assets become oftentimes the most you know, valuable asset that a company has on its balance sheet, they're going to want to make sure that they have appropriate insurance protection uh, behind that. And in order to, um, you know, to qualify, you're going to want to make sure that there's certainly a minimal set of standards. Similar to if you're going to buy you know, fire insurance, you're going to be looking for sprinklers and fire alarms. And uh, it, it'll be a similar uh, in, in the cyber area as well. I think that um, it is still developing, so you're starting to see um, varying levels of questions and varying levels of information that's required uh, to, to, get, to get insurance. But uh, I think that can definitely help uh, drive, drive behavior. And how then do you take it to the next level, uh, to spread that awareness throughout the organization, to spread the sense of urgency that actions must be taken and implemented properly? Is it simply a matter of training? I mean, training helps, but you know, training is a point in time. Um, and then you've got the, what's the quality of that training like? So um, in my mind, you know, the tone from the top around this is quite key, but you also need to uh, use I, I kind of suggest that war stories are a really valuable, insightful ways of engaging your employees. 
So the war stories could, and again, this does come down to who does this and how do you get access to this, but if you can build your knowledge of what's going on outside and inside your business, condense that down into a practical context of war stories that are relevant to your business, and that's about understanding your threats, then you're in a much better place to get an engagement because it's that could happen to us. Mm. Up until that point, it's that's not likely to happen. And that's that, that change of behaviour. I, I use the phrase for culture that it's a moment that matters. So then you go back into your workplace and think, I know the war story, I understand the scenario, this is the moment that could create that. So I won't click on that link from this external email because I've not invited it, I don't know where it's from. You know, it's that... That's the important piece, it, and it mm. kind of the sort of light bulb moment, I guess, comes so, on. So it, it's less about training; it's more about scaring the crap out of them. <laughs> I think it's education. <laughs> it's, it's about education. It's a, it is education. If you give them too much, they don't understand. So it's the war stories that really matter, mm. um, and you know, data loss or data theft is absolutely key to all of this. So that's the human element around it. Sabotage risk. Yeah, it could be introduced by the individual, but technology can help protect against that. So you do need to understand the component parts. Another quick angle to this, actually, which I'll just share what we've done at BDO, because this was really important. We understood the threat landscape for our business has changed significantly, because we're a professional services firm. We're a portal holding all sorts of information, so the outside world want to get to us. Um, and what we were finding from our threat intelligence was that they, they, they worked out who the partner community were, they worked out if we can access through that community or into a, a really good place. We realised they were targeting the PAs and the support staff, so we had to put them through intensive, a completely different type of training to what we would roll out to, to other members of staff. Still equally important, but this was more about you need to know all the scenarios you could be facing and it did scare them a little bit to start with, but once you cleansed it a little bit and understood what this meant, mean, well, they're much more educated now. Mark, what is more useful to you with the, the companies that you deal with? Is it a culture of compliance that people know what actions they're supposed to take, what standard they're supposed to reach, and they tick it off a checklist? Or is it a culture of engagement that they've been thinking about this, they've been anticipating what the next move yeah from cyber criminals might be? No, I would definitely say it was a culture of engagement, but when you're looking at it from an underwriting process, you know, most of the information we have is, is for the compliance checklist. Mm. You know, yes, we're complying with PCI. Yes, you you yeah. live off your grids. Yeah, yes, right, so you, you, but we, we much would rather drill down and try to understand um, you know, what's actually happening on a day-to-day -day basis, because you think about it, you know, typically any sort of insurance contract renews once a year, so you're really doing the enterprise process once and you're not really revisiting it again until a year, and a lot can happen in a year. Um, so I think where the industry is actually moving is you're starting to see more uh, carriers offering or providing more of an end-to-end -end risk management solutions around, and because obviously if, if the, when you look at the types of claims we, we get, uh, the, the two biggest are either hackers or human error. And so that if there's certain investments or things that we can do to help drive down, you're, you're seeing a whole host of loss prevention services. So you're seeing a lot of carriers providing e-learning platforms with training uh, done by security companies with you know, videos, interactive training that sort of links back so that you can actually measure to go through and make sure that the employees or vendors have all taken it and have scored a certain score and they're doing that you know, throughout, throughout the year. Um, and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, supplementing that with actual technology. So, you know, providing a client saying, look, we're going to put this sensor, we're going to put outside your network, but we're going to update it. And as we see activity, we're going to push out the latest known bad IP address every 10 minutes. So even if you have the employer that tries to click on something and go to one of these sites, it's going to stop that. And I think ultimately over time, you're going to see similar to when you do auto insurance where your carrier will put something in the car, uh, you'll, you'll start to see that you know, being put on the network itself and the inside and seeing the type of activity, things that are going. And, and the advantage will be that if they are doing the right things, they are actively engaged, if they are reducing their risk profile, um, that will generate, again, lower premiums, you know, better limits, broader coverage uh, in, in, the, in the industry can almost reward, reward that good behavior. And the point of this, Dinesh, is, is, is that a culture of engagement is more resilient than a culture of just mere compliance. It's how you uh, build in the flexibility uh, that you need Absolutely. to keep ahead of yeah. developments in cybercrime. No, exactly. Um, I, I kind of refer to sort of an analogy that you have um, with corporate culture. Notoriously hard to change, um, but uh, so, so what can you do there? Um, and if you if you take um, it, most large, large organisations, particularly in the financial services sector, 
are just suffocating under a burden of regulatory governance. Um, checklists, guidelines, you know, you name it, you know, it's all there, quite regimented. This is how you, how you need, what you need to have in place. Um, and all, if you responding, don't... all responding to the last crisis, not to the one that's Exactly, and, it, and exactly. And so, you know, what do you do in that scenario? Um, and uh, you know, one solution is to have a very light touch, simple rules based approach to problem solving. Um, because if you have those simple real rules or heuristics in place, then what you can do is you can um, kind of uh, prepare for events that have never happened in the past. But what you're doing is, um, um, ha you know, to bring this to life a little bit, it, it starts with the premise that humans are very creative, um, innovative individuals. And despite a whole raft of policy, that's not going to set you up to actually deal with a threat that you've never seen before. And one thing that we've learned this morning is that the pace of change in the nature of the threats out there is phenomenal. And it's too too much for anyone to keep up with. So how can you, um, you know, are there some simple rules um, that you can bring into effect, and there are there are in the corporate world, and I don't know what the analogous set might be in the kind of in this world that you can use to kind of prepare people, employees, to deal with threats that are almost unknown now, and so it, it's part of their their the fabric of you know how they operate at work, as opposed to being a set of policies that they need to follow because their board tell them to, or the insurance have providers have put in place. Has told them to do so. Um, your input is uh, welcome as always, of course. If you have a, uh, an observation that you want to make, then uh, put your hand up and we'll involve you in the discussion. If there's a question that uh, you want the panel to uh, answer or some members of the panel to answer, then again, uh, put your hand up and we'll get a uh, microphone uh, to you if you want to take part in that discussion. It's uh, an opportunity that may slip away rather faster than you expect if you uh, don't put your hand up uh, at this point. And I'm not seeing uh, any uh, uh, hands at all. If your hand is up and, uh, ah, there is a hand. I was gonna say, if it is up and I haven't seen it, then just shout out, but I've, uh, I've caught it now. If you just wait for the microphone to come down, uh, it's approaching you uh, down the stairs. When it reaches you, tell us who you are and what organization uh, you represent and then carry on with your point. Um, hello, Maureen Kendall, Cybercare. Um, I was very interested in the last remark that Taneshi made about um, simple, simple rules to deal with the unknown. Can you give an example or scenario? Um, so in, in, this, in, in this space, not entirely sure, but um, I, I would sort of say um, in, in what we've seen in, in the corporate space, an example might be... Um, if you're, uh, and a lot of people have a, as part of one of their cultural values, um, something, you know, things like acting or behaving with integrity. Um, but what, what does that actually mean? Um, and uh, it, it's, it's really quite hard to kind of translate that. But something, so that's an example of something that is, doesn't translate to a, a real world scenario very well. But then if you take, um, the health and safety, zero harm culture that we've seen kind of pervade the whole construction industry over the last 10 years. Zero harm as a very simple thing that nobody dies or gets terribly hurt on a construction job is something that is very simple for everyone to understand and something that can be translated into their everyday work. And, you've see, and you know, I've seen the boards, the CEOs, all the way down to a site foreman in construction companies who will start a meeting by just talking about you know, the situation, you know, the, the, the safety culture that they happen to be operating in as relevant to them, but they're made to understand what that actually means to them. So that's something that is pervasive, but very simple, that has worked incredibly successfully in the construction world to reduce the number of fatalities. And, and I, the simplicity is the key part. That's the it, essential component. Exactly, exactly that. And I don't know if there is something here um, uh, in our office, um, we have uh, we, we 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 also have some, some we have the 
the big guidelines and we've got the ISO 27001 and, you know, we've got all that. But then we also have some very simple rules that we, we, we try to enforce. Um, ours is an open plan office. Um, it's a shared office, in fact. And one of the biggest vulnerabilities that we didn't really have our eyes on is, you know, the presence of couriers walking up and down our, through our building. Um, and the ability to, you know, deliver something and equally take something away. And it was just a, a very small oversight, you know, and so something as simple as you need to accompany any guest, anyone who comes through the front door is, is an example. But that's not a, a good example of a heuristic. The zero harm might be a better one. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, gentlemen, in the, right in the middle of the hall, if you put your hand up, that means we can uh, identify you and uh, find you. Uh, with the microphone and uh, as before tell us who you are and what organization you represent. Thank you. Jonathan Knight. I'm from Board Intelligence who work with Dineshi. Um, I, so you're I, not allowed to ask her a question? No, no, I was going to ask one to Steve but just beforehand <laughs> um, I'll say that perhaps the simplest heuristic we have in our office for uh, example of something really simple everyone can do. We have a number of people who are security professionals and we have a huge number of people who aren't so for everyone who isn't we have a very simple always escalate policy see anything that you are concerned about a link that you are worried about um a bag unattended someone in the office who shouldn't be there always escalate and make it really clear who to escalate to and those people nothing's too small you never ever say that was stupid don't don't come to me that kind of thing you always accept it you always encourage it um, and that way, we try to guarantee that any issue does actually get to someone who knows what to do with it. And then those people have the job of making sure the response is good, the communication is good. Um, it's a lesson learned if there was a breach or a potential breach, that, that kind of thing. So it's a simple always escalate policy that we have. Um, I had a quick question for Steve. Sorry, Steve, I missed your breakout sessions earlier. But um, I was really interested in uh, any sort of practical tips you have for how to, um, how to engage a slightly wider group than those professionals in the jargon that matters. I know, I know you've done a breakout policy on this, but, um, but we have a particular, uh, particular issue with people who don't work with tech, well, their only exposure to technology is their laptop. To then say it does actually really matter that you understand what kind of ransomware is, how people might uh, manipulate you into giving data, uh, data away. Um, you said sort of maybe scare them a little bit earlier. Have you got any really good kind of like war games or war stories or recent press examples that, that you could offer up? Because we're always looking for that kind of that kind of thing to engage people. Yeah, okay. Um, well, in terms, of, in terms of the how do you make that work when you've got uh, a variety of different stakeholders in the community, I, and I did major on this in the uh, breakout session, understanding the threats, your actual threats as a business is the starting point because then you can educate the various stakeholders in the right way, overlay that with the moments that matter, which is the cultural angle to this, then starts to change behaviours. And I, you know, the, the bit you said at the start around the escalation process, actually, that's one of the great tools in terms of getting your culture right. There's, that's a supporting culture. So, um, so all of that. In terms of war stories, there are, there are a multitude. I mean, you, know, you can talk about from contractors who actually infiltrate organisations. Now, you've got to be of a certain size to do that. And they're doing it because they've come from a, an activist group or a cyber criminal fraternity. That's an organised, targeted, objective-led attack. And that goes on. That does go on. I wouldn't want you to go out of the room saying, oh, my God, every contract is a problem. It's just you've got to have your eyes open to this. What's the role? What are we giving them access to? Are they the crown jewels? Are we comfortable with this? What, what are we putting around it? So those kind of war stories really start to bring people's, I think, mind to a different place. The classic one, though, is, and this is why the people agenda is what it is, is the external phishing attacks. You know, that's what everyone's trying to do because it's kind of low cost, high reward. If you do it a thousand times, you get a few bites, you're going to get some, you know, relatively okay outcomes. So that, in that, go back to what we did at BDO, that became absolutely evident that we had to get the right stakeholders really understanding what the moments that matter are, what to look for. So back to, you know, kind of a, a zero type attack in that community, that's what that was really. We defined it as that. So how do we teach them to look for the link? It's an email that Steve Rumble's not asked for. What does the email address look like? It's got BDO zero in it. This is how sophisticated they're trying to get from the outside world. Right, a little bit of an alarm bell here. I'll hold that, pick it up with Steve when I next see him, we escalate. And that's kind of how you start to change your behaviours and culture. But it did take the education of the, the PAs and support staff to really start to engage in that. Uh, thank you, and we have a hand right at the back. This will be the, the last question, uh, I'm afraid. And uh, brief is good. 
Hi there, I'm uh, Gavin Clegg from North Midland Construction. Uh, just really touching, it's not really a question, just a, uh, we've been embedding uh, health and safety culture or good health and safety culture in our business for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, for the last 10 years, we've run a, what's called positive interventions uh, where, and we've just rolled out security breaches and positive interventions through that process as well. So it's, it's, we've already got the culture of raising uh, when we've got an issue, whether it's on health and safety, quality or environmental issues, we already raise it and close it out used through positive interventions. We've just rolled out that as part of security as well, raising that, that awareness as well within the okay. business. So just a statement, yeah. Yep, thank you for sharing that example uh, with us. Uh, Steve, just as a, as a last thought to round off the discussion, uh, we heard this morning that you cannot be 100% preventative something will get through, which means that you need to have a recovery plan. What should it look like? Yeah, so let's assume you, you, your protection around, so prevent and protect are quite different. So you know, prevent is about the outside world getting in first level. Pr protection is how do you layer thereafter to protect your crown jewels. So assuming that's all been broken and you're now into a, a kind of doomsday scenario and response plan. There's the kind of classic thing, it's a crisis management scenario really. Golden hour, 24 hours, what does that look like? And how have you deployed your thinking around that? So war game is a really good a tool for that. So bring the right people into a room, let's war game it and see how we would respond. And then you build your learning from that. Um, and then the other thing is, um, how are you going to minimize the outcome, the consequences? Uh, of what that looks like, you know, talk, talk. I think, you know, you can reflect on it in lots of ways. They tried, and more likely got it, you know, in terms of public communication, did they have all the facts to hand before they went public on it? So all that kind of thing around communication strategy becomes important as well. So it isn't, again, a technology issue. This is a business issue. It's broader than that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for your questions and your input as well. Please join me in thanking our panel, uh, Steve Rumble, uh, Dineshi Ramesh and Mark Kimmelow. Thank you very much. Thank you.